with, with, um, with that said, I would like to open it up to uh, two, two, two questions right now. Are you relying on counties to require an EIR? Are you just establishing an EIR to begin with? Are you doing a master EIR or program EIR or individual EIRs per uh, cultivation area? Can you go, can you expand on that? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. That's a really good question. So, um, so the Department of Food and Ag is preparing a programmatic EIR that's looking at the potential impacts of the licensing program across the entire state. Um, and so uh, by nature of that, that it's a statewide environmental impact report, it is not going into a gory amount of detail for individual cultivation sites or individual locations. It's just beyond the scope of what the state can accomplish. One of the real challenges uh, for the CEQA analysis, for the environmental impact report, is that uh, when you do an environmental analysis, what you're supposed to establish is the baseline, what's happening today. And then what, what's going to change as a result of the licensing program and what the impacts of that increment of change might cause. Well, one of the things we don't have is a lot of good information on what exactly is happening today. I mean, we understand how people grow cannabis, but we don't know where exactly everybody is, how large their operations are, how long they've been doing it, uh, what the specifics of how they in particular. So baseline conditions, very difficult to establish. Uh, and then the increment of change. How many people are going to come under this licensing program? At what size? Are these existing operations? Are they new operations? So uh, the Department of Food and Ag has circulated some surveys trying to gather that type of information and better understand um, what level of, uh, of interest there is in the program, how many licenses are going to come online. So that, those are some of the kind of uh, uh, methodology challenges. But getting back to your question about local requirements, the state is definitely looking to local government to address issues that are most important uh, for the local communities. And similar to a state's rights issue, the state is uh, looking at that zoning and land use type of decisions. Those are decisions that are made in city and county general plans. That's really within the purview of local agencies to comply with. A local noise standard, that would be something also that would uh, local government would establish. And so when, uh, when an applicant comes forward to the state um, and they make application, uh, the state's going to be interested to see the CEQA document that was done, the environmental impact report or whatever it might be, uh, that was done for either the county ordinance or that specific grow site. And they're going to have to independently verify that all of the environmental impacts between the statewide EIR that they did and whatever the local government did covers it. Now if it doesn't, um, then there may be a need for the Department of Food and Agriculture to do an additional more detailed study or perhaps push back on the, on the counties and cities. They have not made a determination as how to exactly to handle that. Uh, there's the full range from notice, of my, from what I've heard, local governments have gone from everywhere from a notice of exemption uh, all the way up to a full-blown EIR. And you know, another thing for the statewide EIR, we, we understand that there's a number of counties and cities throughout the state that have outright banned cannabis cultivation, all sorts of, can all sorts of cannabis commerce. Um, our fundamental assumption is that that may change at any time, and we are not going to be assuming that just because Fresno County has a ban in place today, that ban will be in place three years from now. So we're really trying to create an environmental analysis and a regulatory program that's going to be durable in the light of all the changing regulations and laws and ordinances that are passed. Um, in, my, in my misspent youth, um, I was an assistant deputy mayor for Richard Reardon, um, and I was a Democrat, Republican, and my job was a planning deputy for him. And in that role was to look at EIR, CEQA, and ways to make businesses, um, make CEQA less onerous on business. More important, to try to achieve certainty. So when you go into the process, you know when you're gonna come out, and you'll know what you need to do once the local authority has uh, opined that you're, you're good and ready to go. Um, when I talk to Ag and the rest um, of the other governmental agencies, I tell them that let's not keep piling restrictions on top of restrictions on top of restrictions because we're trying to figure out every type of problem that could occur. Instead, let's think of ways that we can protect the community, but also ensure that businesses are able to know what it will take to actually open that door. And I think for most of you, if not all of you, um, that's what you want. You're not trying to get around 
EIRs or neg decks or any of that. You just don't want to get trapped in some kind of spiral, out of control EIR that lasts 10 years or 20 years. And so uh, I, I plan to personally work with all the entities involved to ensure that um, maybe for the first time we can come up with some type of certainty on, on EIRs and other things. Right, and, and just to build off that, because I think that's an, a really good point, is, is just the endless cycle. Um, the way the law is set up is that the state standards are the minimum standards. Local governments can establish standards that are more stringent, but not less. And so in theory, by the time you've come forward to the state, you already have met the basic minimum standards through complying with the local requirements, which have to at least match the states. Now that said, there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg thing because many local governments want to have people ready to go with their approvals on January 1st, 2018, yet the state won't have adopted regulations yet. So the local governments don't even know what the state requirements are going to be. Um, there is a first draft of the regulations that's going to be circulated early next year, and there's going to be three more rounds of public review. So it's our hope that through that process, people will have a pretty good idea and can start to get ready for what the state requirements will be. Obviously, the banking issue is a huge issue. It's going to be a major issue for the state of California. So when will we see action in Congress? Oh, no, there is. There's movement all along the front, along a wide front now compared to what it was uh, four, five years ago, and uh, uh, we, I would expect that there to be some major improvement, uh, in, in, at least laying the foundation for this industry's financial uh, status sometime within the next two years. Uh, and that is, uh, let me just note, that is if the administration has a positive approach to it, and we don't know exactly what Donald Trump's approach will be, but let me just make the Republican argument on this, and that is, I have personally been deeply disappointed in what so many Democrat uh, uh, office holders and, and people with authority, now that they could do something, uh, have stepped back, including our own Attorney General, I have uh, the United States Attorney General's office. Uh, I end up, look, I wrote into the law, I know, I wrote the law that says it is, that the federal government is not, cannot spend any dollars, any resources on, over, uh, on overriding a state that has agreed to make the medical use of marijuana uh, legal. And how many times ignoring that do we see the DEA and people from the Justice Department going in and attacking people in medical marijuana uh, operations and, uh, of course, stealing their property uh, through, with a, you know, uh, confiscation. Uh, and, and it's stealing. I don't care what to say. That this is uh, uh, asset forfeiture is nothing more than, than theft of the worst kind. And we need to make sure that, uh, anyway, to answer your question, uh, I believe now, and I hope again, this isn't just a, you can't just say the Democrats are liberals, so they're gonna, they're gonna be on board and help us. They haven't been, okay? And uh, I've had to write judges, I've had to threaten the Attorney General of the United States. This is illegal for you to do because I wrote the law and a law passed and was signed into law. I think that we are going to see some major reform if indeed uh, my, my Republican colleagues can look at the marijuana business as they should. It is a business and there is nothing more immoral. Some people have hurt themselves on marijuana, we know that. We know some people have just uh, smoked themselves in, uh, outside of a job, you know, et cetera. But, Compare that to alcohol. Compare that to gambling. Compare that to people who eat too much sugar, for Pete's sakes. And uh, uh, right now, they're gonna, we're going to have to look at the marijuana business financially, should be treated like any other business, and my darn Republican friends should understand what that means. There you go. So, so. Thank you, Congressman. I, I hope it's true, two years. I uh, am very hopeful, but we have to prepare. 
in case it doesn't. Um, this year, Susan Bonilla had a bill, AB 2149, that would allow the BOE to collect the fees for all of these new agencies who are gonna be licensing um, all of you. The uh, Department of Food and Ag, the Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Public Health, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now, if, number one, there is no banking access and everyone is still paying cash, where is everyone gonna go to pay all these fees? One place in Sacramento? I mean, so, we are hoping that the BOE, we have 23 offices around the state, that we will be able to accept these payments. And unfortunately, that bill got stuck, but we're gonna uh, try to move it next year because um, we're hopeful, but we also have to prepare. And I have been studying this for a good year. Uh, Tim Moreland and I have been trying, we have met with everyone, talked with everyone, have gone through every scenario, and unfortunately, until the Congress acts and allows banking access, we are kind of stuck here in California unless we figure out how we're gonna create our own state bank or expand the services of the BOE since we have been collecting taxes, right, for 20 years. Um, so that's kind of where we're, we're at right now, Congressman, and we look forward to your leadership. Okay, let me make sure I give you a specific challenge. Anybody who's just agreed with the, the things I've said, Go and see your congressperson. Make an appointment to see your congressperson. You are a constituent. You want to be more effective? Get a couple of veterans from town to go with you. You want to be more effective? Have a meeting with your congressperson and a group of senior citizens and some veterans and yourself. Go and see them, confront them with what their constituents are telling them. And uh, that, uh, to get, the business end done, we've got to make sure that that congressman is confronted by their own, uh, by their own constituents. Hi there, Congressman. This is geared to you. I'm kind of a new, uh, new mayor. I just was reelected again. But we have an issue in Catalina, as you know, and I'm sure you've visited us before. Um, transportation of any cannabis is a federal offense. The FFA regulates it, the Coast Guard, the local carriers, um, U.S. Post Office, so we're kind of in a quandary as we move forward to try to get uh, medicine to our, to our residents of Avalon. Do, do you have any advice on anything we might be able to do so that we're, so that every one of our patients are not breaking the law? I don't have a, uh, a, a magic bullet on this. This is a we are evolving out of the most stupid law in the history of our country. And, and there's no way that we're going to shoot through all of those years of idiocy in which, in which our, our public officials were spending their time uh, trying to control our private behavior, and especially the private behavior in terms of consuming, uh, you know, marijuana. Uh, so that was, and, and as we know, look, Canada grows hemp and we've just, we can't even grow hemp to make a rope and we're denying our farmers a billion and a half dollars a year. Worth of, that's how much Canada makes for selling the hemp to us just for rope and not to mention the other uses for, for hemp and, and marijuana and things. So look, there's no easy answer, I'm sorry, just going to take day after day, year after year, reform after reform, we gotta walk it back, and it's gonna take about five years before it's probably gonna be a point where we can all say, well, this is now operating like a full regular business. Well, and then my question is then, on, with regards to the DEA, is there anything from a grassroots level on up we can do to get them to reschedule, reschedule that as a class one instead of waiting for them because they just denied it again. Well, the secret is that uh, uh, we don't want them to reschedule, we want them to deschedule. So, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, right. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, I know that's what you meant, but that's not what they meant. I've got to tell you right now, they know that they know what they're doing, and oh yes, we'll go to schedule two. That's wonderful. They can control all of us just as much 
and uh, it, it would disaster for everybody who's gone out of the way to try to help people, especially in the medical marijuana area, a total disaster for the whole medical marijuana option. So, uh, uh, no, we can, listen, we gotta walk it back. We gotta, uh, what I just said, you guys applauded. You get a majority members of Congress wouldn't know what the hell we were talking about. And so, uh, you gotta get their attention. Go see your congressman. Get the vets to go with you. Get the seniors to go with you. And, uh, uh, and other people that can just talk to me. And that's the way you do it. And I'm sorry, I wish I could be more optimistic that there's gonna be one bill passed next year that's gonna solve the financial part of it. So, but we will move forward, we'll try our best, so thank you. Thank you, thank and, you very much. Uh, and, I, and I just wanna offer, you know, the, 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 the Congressman is right about getting the right-minded individuals in Congress that will ultimately move on this issue. Now, I, I believe that hopefully after November, there'll be an a Congress and the Senate, and that the President, that she will be able to make the changes <laughs> that we need to, like the Congressman said, deschedule it, not reschedule it. Uh, because ultimately, uh, any agency will only go as far as what Congress, the Senate, and the President will let them. And so, yes, it's important to go and, and insist that your elected officials are, are on the same page as you and deal with reality. For, for me, why it's personal, because cannabis in the African American community, Latino community, has been devastating. It's been used to lock up more Latino and African American individuals in this country than ever before. And it's another form of incarceration, or what we call the prison plantation, and in a lot of ways, a form of slavery. And we've got to make that change. We've got to get that message through. And the reason I talk about the public safety aspect, they're using it to not deschedule it. They're using the, the harms, the supposed harms that come from it to convince others that we can't do anything or to paralyze elected officials and I'll say both Democrats and Republicans, um, to not move on this issue. And, and so it is imperative, it's imperative that as alcohol was way back when, was considered harmful and no one wanted to, to bring it back, it is our responsibility to ensure that people understand what the true safety aspects of it so that the DEA will have the comfort level to either get out of the way or to advise the Congress, the Senate, and the President so that we can make some substantive moves on this issue. Uh, my question is specifically to uh, Mr. Reggie Jones. This is uh, regarding AB 2385, which I believe you authored, and the UCBA have been the bankers of. This is the same organization that a couple of weeks ago in the city hall meeting were the only opposition to an opening up the licensing market in LA to specifically um, allow for a more diverse market and ownership rather than just people that work for the 43 or 65 white dispensary owners. Um, now, since the city of LA has really changed their stance on it and are looking to the community to get feedback and are really interested in a licensing system, uh, do you plan on withdrawing that bill or amending it so it will be a fair market to everyone rather than a specific, um, I would say, leeway to a very select group? So, so measure D, is that the one you're referring to? gives and basically waives the requirement for a city permitting to the people it, that it, had, that were measure decompliant. It'll, it'll, and it also allows for the local government, the city of Los Angeles, which I'm from, the ability to open up the market to others. Right now, they feel that they're prohibited because of the, the, the measure D law. And in between when we make the regulation, 
when we ultimately have all the rules and regulation, and now it gives the city of Los Angeles, especially the elected officials there, the city council and the mayor, and to some extent the city attorney, an opportunity to either go back to the citizens or to create laws so that they can become a little more inclusive. Um, their challenge is they have, as you said, there are very few, 135 dispensaries, but they're dealing with close to 1,400 dispensaries in Los Angeles. And uh, my concern is, is, is not the legal ones or the potential legal ones, and the concern of the council are probably the hundreds and hundreds of the illegal ones that give all of you a bad name that, are, that have been open. We've got to be a little more diligent, and we've got to be a little, a little more, not a little more, we've got to be a lot more uh, responsive to closing those down so that those of you who are working here will not be saddled with what they're doing. And that's what Measure D is supposed, I mean, that's what the bill is supposed to do. And I'd just like to say the BOE, we love referrals. So you can refer people over to us. I'm just kidding. Dana, my question is for you. Um, and, and an extreme amount of gratitude I have for you for defunding the Department of Justice from going after legitimate um, compliant businesses. However, um, we've, we're now seeing some rogue agencies that aren't necessarily the DEA. Um, go into other counties outside their jurisdiction, raiding licensed facilities. Um, I want to know, other than a lawsuit, what are our options to stop this from happening? It's actually called Trident. Um, it's a Sacramento County, Placer County, and El Dorado County, a tri-county task force that went into Yolo County with a Placer County warrant and took down a licensed and legal farm um, 12 days ago. Was there was there any federal agents involved at all, cross sworn? Your state I don't believe so. Um, they showed up in unmarked cars and uh, they didn't identify themselves. I don't believe that there were any DEA agents present. They just pulled in people from these three counties. This is totally insane. <laughs> They got a bunch of people who think because they, they got a badge they wear, you know where they go in and act like, like a criminal gang and like a bunch of marauders breaking into people's homes? You know, just, you know, one of the, one of the things, we have a horrible situation in our country right now. And right as we speak, and it's not this, it's that we've got black Americans and law enforcement in, the, in a dynamic that's a horrible, horrible dynamic where they're both, feeding on each other's fear, and they're feeding on each other's hatred, et cetera. This is police, uh, the more police officers get, somebody shoots at them, the more they shoot a bunch of people, the more we then shoot at police officers. This is a horrible cycle, and let me tell you, the marijuana element of this is, there's, a, there's, there's an element, a huge element. The guy, the fellow they just shot the other day, you know, oh, well, he, he had some marijuana on him. Well, big deal, you know? The bottom line is that this law has done more to cause the hatred between the police who should be there to protect people in all, every one of our communities and are, but they, we put them at odds with honest citizens. And of course, what they said, this other guy, they also said, well, he had a gun. I'm sorry, I'm sure some people disagree with me on this. Who cares if he has a gun? If he's an honest person and is protecting himself, I don't care if he has a gun, and I don't care if he has a baggie of marijuana either. The bottom line is that he was no threat to anybody else, and the police, a lot of police, will use marijuana as an excuse in the black and Chicano neighborhoods. And you know, of course, if, if a kid from an affluent neighborhood gets arrested, we know what happens. His mommy and daddy get the lawyer, and this guy not only doesn't he have, it's expunged from his record, and, and they, we're lucky if they spend even one day in jail. But in the, small, in the poor communities, you end up with giving a guy a, a mark on his record that will prevent him from getting work 10 years down the road, and it ruins his life. So I, uh, these people, are, if there are groups of people running around with uniforms and all kinds of badges, 
molesting the people who are not doing any harm to anybody else. The only thing it's going to do, we've got to rise up and make sure that the uh, that there's some basic change in our country. By the way, I thought you were talking about international things. And there's another look. Do not give authority to international organizations. If you think that the oppression that we suffer here are bad, wait till you give uh, global government the right to do some of these things. What a horror story. So I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, and, and please let us know, because I'm looking at my staff, and we haven't heard about it. And a lot of times when there's raids in the community, um, we do get calls, and we're trying to figure out who it is, where it is, who authorized it, who was on the raid, what was the purpose, who had the warrants. Um, and we have not heard about this one. So um, Tim Moreland right there, if you can exchange cards with him, um, we will follow up on this. Thank you. This is our last Next question. Last. This is the last question. Well, I want to thank you all for all the work you've done on this. But I do have one question for Reggie Smith. I met you last year. For the grower, and I'm a grower, and I'm probably one of the few people here who's a grower, so I need to represent them. The biggest burden for growers in the Macarissa is the distribution system. And we find that that is going to kill us all. The law says every movement of a product from one licensee to another licensee must be done by a distributor. Is that gonna change? Because if it doesn't, all the small growers are just dead in the water, run out of business by the alcohol industry. So, I know when, when that discussion came up, there was a very cognitive decision that was made about the distributorship. Um, we can talk about ways that is not onerous on the growers, but for, for and I'll just use the word bureaucrat because I, I, I was one at one time. Um, we have to ensure that the product gets to the, the sale point that everything is, is not only legal, but it's safe and that we can tax it, and, that, and, and that's what that discussion was really about. I'm, just, I'm telling you the reality of it. Um, and I'm perfectly willing after this to talk to you about making sure that it's not onerous on it. Um, I know law enforcement had a concern about straight point to sale, but we, we get not a but, and we can discuss it right after this. So I can come up with some solutions for you. I, um, I, I hear you. As, as an association, I'll just speak on it real quick. That's our number one priority, is to fix that as, as, uh, as soon as we can. The reality is, with the distribution companies who kind of came in to like, try and force some of those issues on there, didn't even understand what they were getting on them, the amount of liability they were gonna have to have. So there is a lot of room to, to, to move on this. We've already been having discussions with some of the labor unions who are working on this, and I mean you will also have some dis discussions in more detail. But as, as a trade association, that's is our number one priority, is getting that fixed. So, um, and that is it for questions. So actually, there's actually well, there's one thing I would like to add to all of this. Um, the topic of this was what's gonna happen in 2018, kind of like you, with the goal being you hearing what might happen. The reality is, is you can actually help affect that change. Right now, the three agencies, the Department of Food and Ag, the California Department of Public Health, the Medical Cannabis, no, no, it's, it, it's they changed it, not bummer. They, it's now, can, now it's now it's like a big murder. Um, the Bureau of Cannibal, Cannabis, uh, of Medical Cannabis Regulation, they're, they're holding stakeholder hearings up and down the state. You can go to their websites. You can also go to our website, cacannabisindustry.org. We have all that data there. Get involved. Even if you can't attend a meeting, take the time to type up what your, pri what your priorities would be. Send it in, because they are taking comment from everybody. And unlike in, in the past, as someone who's been working on this issue for about six years, and I've worked on local ordinances, state ordinances, state initiatives, the reality is now these regulators want to hear from us. I mean. These three agencies that are having to write your, create your, your, your licenses, understand they don't know everything. They are reaching out to us on a daily basis. I mean, my members have gone through numerous 
meetings with the directors of all three agencies. So get involved now, and you won't have to wait to, to 2018 to find out what, what actually happens. And let me, let me just add that uh, the Department of Food and Ag is having scoping meetings tomorrow night in Pasadena from 4 to 7, and also uh, Wednesday night in Desert Hot Springs, same time. It's on their website. If you search MCCP, CDFA, you'll find it. Uh, so please come out. You can talk to the director of their program there. Thanks. Fiona, real quick. And then on our website, we do have uh, brochures and information uh, specifically to the cannabis industry, www.boe. Dot ca dot gov. And we've also done a couple of YouTube stakeholder meetings on track and trace, transportation, and banking, which is also on our website. Excellent. And I want to make sure, Daisha Austin, could you stand up, Daisha? She's from my office. She has my cards. I plan to be intimately involved in the regulations because that's what I like. That's what I do. Um, and that's what I have experience in. And so... I need your input so that we can make sure that when 2018 rolls out, it doesn't harm anyone and it's the best thing since sliced bread because we actually want to put Oregon and Colorado out of business. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, the, and, and he's not lying. I mean, after he passed the bill, we had numerous discussions, but he has a lot of concerns on the way these things are going to look. I mean, all these people here.